Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ask Brick. So Ask Brick is my Q&A show here on YouTube where I let my subscribers and viewers on Instagram, Twitter, things like that ask me questions and I answer them in this Ask Brick format. In order to keep things rolling and to answer each question in a little bit more detailed, I answer about five questions per episode. So if you did ask some questions in the last few weeks, I promise I am getting to them. I did just have a backlog of questions, so you have to stay tuned. Check out every episode. I'm trying not to make these Q&A videos too long because I want to keep viewers interested and entertained. But I have five questions today and let's get right into them. So the first question is actually from an Instagram poll I did on my story, so users can ask questions without the whole world seeing who asked them. So I'm going to respect their privacy and keep them anonymous, so I'll just say IG user. So the Instagram user asks, what advice would you give to grow and run a successful YouTube channel? Honestly, I don't feel I'm the best person to ask uh, this question to. I've been doing YouTube since 2012. I've really, really enjoyed my time on YouTube. I've learned so, so much and like really grown my skill. And I've definitely grown my channel from having zero subscribers to over, you know, 70,000, almost 80,000 now. Really enjoyed my time here on YouTube. I will, I will acknowledge the fact that I did get lucky a couple times, a couple times here on YouTube with my subscribers because I would upload a video. My first Will It Float video, I only had 4,000 subscribers. That was about after four, maybe five years of like really hard work on YouTube. I'd only accumulated 4,000 subscribers, but those were my 4,000 subscribers, and I was so proud of that. And then I uploaded a Will It Float video, and I gained like 15,000 subscribers in a month. So I went with 20,000 subscribers for a while, 25. Like It was amazing. Really loved that. A few years later, I just kept, I kept growing subscribers as well. A few years later, I came out with another Will It Float video. I got about 50,000 subscribers. You know, I jumped another 25. And then last year, I also came out with a Will It Float video. That one didn't take as off as much as the previous years. But now I am here with, you know, 70-some thousand subscribers, almost 80-some thousand. Definitely, those videos really helped me out and gained me a lot of subscribers. At the same time, those viral videos, while they gained a lot of subscribers, unfortunately, a lot of times, they didn't convert over to regular channel viewers. Because those subscribers are tuning in for bolt videos, and unfortunately, I'm not uploading bolt videos every day of the year. So, like, I do recognize that I do have a large, a large portion of my subscriber number. While they're all real people, I didn't buy subscribers. They just don't watch my videos because maybe the content now isn't as interesting to them as when they subscribe. It's also hard because I have been on YouTube for so many years. Um, lots of people subscribed and then maybe got at a Lego or something like that, or just hasn't been on their accounts for a while. So, the number. My, the moral of that story is numbers aren't everything on YouTube. If you have 2,000 subscribers, but if you're getting 4,000 views per video or 10,000 views per video or something like that, you're doing something right versus somebody who has 200,000 subscribers and is getting 50 views a video. So it's just numbers aren't everything. Really look at the people who are watching your channel, and that's how I would recommend you measure your success on YouTube is like the comments, engagements, the people watching your videos, the fans, things like that. Like really focus on that and try not to worry about the numbers too much. In regards to just growing and trying to run a successful YouTube channel, consistency for me has been number one. I find I get really busy. I'm the first one to admit that. I get really busy and I'll go weeks without it uploading videos and stuff like that and I've learned this year I can't do that like as somebody who relies on YouTube and stuff like that to pay rent in a space like this for my business I really have to be more consistent and I find once you once you stop uploading I find for my channel at least this could be different for every channel like if I'm uploading every day my viewers is just going way 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 up and then all of a sudden I stop uploading my views are still going up or they're staying the same but then they just, they'll drastically drop and I'll like lose a lot of watch time, I'll lose a lot of views in the last 48 hours. Like I can see those numbers dropping. And then I start uploading again, but it takes time to really hit that peak again and then drops again. So this year I'm really, really focusing. I renewed the lease for the space. So I'm just really making sure that I'm uploading videos now and continuing to like stagger them out. I'm not trying to have all these highs and lows because consistency is key when growing YouTube channels because the algorithm really re recognizes who's uploading lots and things like that. So that's, this has been a really long answer, but what advice would I give to a, run a YouTube channel? Don't focus too much on the numbers. It's not all about the numbers and upload a lot because viewers want to see content they want to see it they want to see it now and then honestly just do what makes you happy i might not have as many subscribers as somebody who reviews every single lego set the day it comes out but that that wouldn't make me happy the stress of trying to get to the lego store to buy the set to build the set to upload the video like that's not i i do this for fun i do this for hobby i make videos i enjoy and i enjoy the videos i make so don't worry about the numbers too much the next instagram user asked what is one lego set that you regret buying so I thought of this one when I saw this question. 
I honestly didn't really come up with a great answer for you. I would say overall, just one of the two things. I have two answers to this question. So one, for my personal collection, one of the things I regret buying are Lego friend sets. So I bought a lot of them throughout the year. Throughout the years, um, they're cool. They're cool sets, some of them. But like I'd see them on sale at Walmart and stuff like that. Maybe like especially with buildings when I wanted more buildings in my Lego City. You know, Lego City the line doesn't have enough buildings. And this is back when I, especially when I was a lot younger. But like Lego Friends had all these buildings. They had restaurants, juice bars, pet shops, houses, all this stuff. So I would often buy those and add them to my Lego City. But the problem was because they were more odd colors. Um, you know, pinks and purples and stuff like that. Obviously, I don't want to add pinks and purple to my Lego City. It's supposed to be a realistic Lego City. So you'd often find me taking parts off just to make it more, like, neutral colors and things like that, which I ended up spending so much money on these Lego friend sets that are only half the building. Like, they're only six studs wide, but I, like, they just didn't fit in my city right. So I bought a ton of these sets, and, like, they've just kind of gone to waste. I never used the mini dolls. I had to, I have a ton of pink and purple pieces now just because, I didn't build them in my set. They're great to have in my collection. But I would just say overall, probably Lego friend sets are some of the ones I regret buying the most. Just because a lot of times they're not even that cheap. But like now I'm stuck with all these mini doll parts and other just parts that I don't really use a lot. When I could have maybe just saved that money up and bought a new modular building or something like that. And then the second part of this question was actually from, I can't remember the user's name. So I really apologize if you're watching this video. But... They did a Q&A, like top five tips for starting a Brickling store, and they talked about don't buy sets just because you want to part them out. And I used to do that. I commented this on their video when I, a couple of years ago, when I just wanted to grow my Brickling store, I just wanted numbers in the store. Like I was just trying to get to like a thousand different parts because I don't, I didn't have any capital to start a store, but I really wanted one. So I was, just, I would go to Walmart and buy like one single mixel or one, I did do that once. I bought a single mixel to part out. I added like 40 pieces to my store. Part of value is probably eight dollars. I pay, probably paid like six dollars for the set, and I still have some of those parts in my store because I only parted I parted out one one singular mixel. So there's pieces in one quantity. Nobody wants to buy just one of a piece. Like they want multiples. So that's why now I'll only ever part out multiples of a set. Um, and I really like who, who cares what the number in your store is if you're putting in random stuff that nobody cares about. You're you're not gonna grow your store. You're not gonna grow your sales, and like that's woohoo! Now you've grown your inventory. But you have to store that, and like it's just sitting there, not making you money. So I would say that was like really good advice. And those are sets that I regret buying. Are just sets to part out just to have more things in my inventory. I don't want to do that anymore. That's a two-part question for sure. This video is definitely going to be a little bit longer because that was only the second question. I'll try and speed it up for these next few. Oscar's Lego World asks, what is your favorite Lego modular building? So I think I've said this, uh, I've said this a few times, but my favorite set in general is just the Lego Grand Emporium. I think that set looks amazing. The interior is not the best. Um, so I guess out of favorite LEGO modular buildings, while the Grand Emporium is still my favorite LEGO set, I would say one of them is definitely the Assembly Square. Just a very big set, three different buildings in one. The details on the inside are pretty great, and overall it was just a really fun set to build. So I would say the Assembly Square is my favorite modular building, but the Grand Emporium is still my favorite LEGO set, if that makes sense. Bricks asks, when will you finish your LEGO City? Great question. So the city is a never ending thing that just keeps constantly getting changed and modified and I have a ton of fun making the city. So I don't think there's an end date in sight. Just when I think I finish it up, I go ahead and switch up the city just because hey, it's there, it's made of Lego, it's meant to be played with, it's meant to be switched around and have fun. Right now, I guess you're probably referring to the Lego City updates I've been doing recently. Unfortunately, uh, the city is like pretty much in the same state you would have seen from the Lego City update number two. I did have some big plans to work on it, um, but unfortunately I've just been so busy with all the other YouTube videos I've been trying to make, I've been reorganizing my entire LEGO collection and resorting everything, which has just taken up a huge chunk of my time. You'll be seeing the sorting video soon, if not already, but overall just the city's never ending. Hopefully it gets finished by the end of summer in like a finished state, and then of course things never change, but like I get what you mean because right now there's a huge just spot of blankness on my city, so I hope to deal with that soon. But no timeline in sight. 
Alright, so my last question here is from M Lego 17 Are you ever going to make another attempt at the corner gas mock? So that's a great question. So I do actually have the original corner gas mock that I made a few years ago. Corner Gas is a Canadian TV show that aired from like 2005 to 2009, I think. Here, uh, It was all over the world, but it was filmed in Canada, which is really cool. It was a big hit. They did five or six seasons. Um, a few years later, they actually released a, a Corner Gas movie. And then a few years after that, they're actually doing a Corner Gas animated series. Overall, it's a really good show. It's really, really funny. Um, I used to watch it with my grandparents as a kid. That was like one of my favorite. I loved going to their house to watch Corner Gas with my grandpa. Like it was overall just a really great show. In an episode, they actually did a Corner Gas Lego mock, and I just thought that would be incredible to kind of recreate. So I came home and I actually built my own Lego creation. Um, out of, I only I built my own Corner Gas mock, and I've had it for the last few years. I still have it actually on the other side of my Lego Studio. The video is still up on my YouTube channel. I was so proud of the mock the time I did it. I remember I like posted a ton of I posted a video. I posted a ton of pictures and stuff on Twitter. I got retweeted by a bunch of the Corner Gas cast, um, Karen, things like that. I had people from all over Canada messaging me trying to buy the custom minifigure that I painted of Brent Butt. I actually did sell a few. Um, also made a custom Lego sign, which I did, again, I sold a few across Canada. Like, it was really fun trying to do that. Uh, Brent Butt, uh, he was the main, you know, the, the star and the writer of the show. He also retweeted it. I've met him a few times in person. We've talked about it. He's really cool. I met a couple of the other cast members. Oscar, I actually have a video of him calling me a jackass. Like, overall, just a really cool show. The mock I made a few years ago, unfortunately, is not the most accurate to the show. Um, it's really cool. It's really... I. I'm still proud of it, don't get me wrong, but it's obviously not the most accurate, but just given the, the, the current circumstances, like I haven't finished my LEGO City yet, um, things like that, I'm probably not going to be redoing that mock anytime soon. I'd love to make it a little bit more accurate to the show, a little bit more detailed, but of course, like my priorities have really shifted. Corner Gas, I don't really watch it a ton anymore, I only ever watch the rerun once when it's on TV, but... It's a great show, don't get me wrong, but like I like the mock the way it is. It's kind of like my NCIS mock. Not the most detailed, could use some work, but I really like it the way it is, and I don't want to change it up too much. So I'm probably just going to leave it the way it is and enjoy it how I have it right now. Definitely, if you haven't heard of Corner Gas, you should check out that show. But for the meantime, I'm just going to leave my mock the way it is, and I don't see myself really attempting to make another one. Just get, I still have that one. I still like it, so why bother? All right, so thanks, everybody, so much for watching this episode of Ask Brick. Sorry it was so long-winded. Um... The first few questions I wanted to go in detail with, and then I like to talk, so sorry this episode was a lot longer than some of the other ones, but it's a good thing I only did five questions in the episode. But yeah, thanks again for watching. If you have questions for me for Ask Brick, please leave them down in the comments below. If you'd like to respond to any of the Ask Brick questions that I talked about in this video, please feel free to do so as well. Looking forward to reading your responses, and of course, uh, answering your questions in a few episodes. As I said, they are a little delayed right now, but I will get to your questions soon. So thanks again for watching, and have a great day.